Dear Seven, thank you for listening to that um, interlude music. Um, an exciting scene today. It's long. We have to do some close reading, but it's extremely rewarding. The symbolism is Shakespeare at his best. Um, it's a whodunit, it's a murder mystery, there's action, and it brings together virtually all of the key characters in the play. So, but before that, let's review satire. What was satire, do you remember? Yes, it's that use of humour to mock serious matters, so it's uh, making fun of people's bad behaviour. And you'll remember last term studying Roman stock characters, Senex, Adolescents, Virgo, the Servus Kylidus, uh, Meritrix, which of those does a porter most resemble? Bit of a memory test there. Today you need to know what pathetic fallacy is. If you don't know already, it's the literary technique of using the weather to reflect the emotional tone of the scene. Pathetic fallacy, what a bizarre exp expression. Well, there was a lecturer at Oxford called Ruskin, Oxford University, and he suggested that some poets were being pathetic, actually, he said. They were showing emotional falseness when they were giving feelings to things that don't usually have feelings. For instance, he took this extract. They rode her in across the rolling foam, the cruel, crawling foam. Ruskin said, hang on, foam can't be crawling, nor can be cruel. I myself wrote a story once, and uh, somebody looking at it said, rivers, um, rivers meander, people don't, they're walking down the street. So Ruskin, and you'll find out a little more about him if you ever study Oscar Wilde next year, brilliant writer. Um, he, uh, Ruskin said that, yes, it's pathetic to call things, uh, give feelings to things that don't have feelings. We now basically link pathetic fallacy to the weather. So it's using the weather to reflect emotions in a scene. So what weather is usually associated with bad feelings, bad news? Um, somebody, someone's lost a loved one or they've, um, or they've had some trauma, what weather is usually associated with that? And how did Shakespeare use pathetic fallacy at the beginning of the play? If you've forgotten what the weather was like at the beginning of the play, when you saw, saw the witches, Google it the text. Today we're going to look at reactions to the murder, we're going to read and understand Act 2, Scene 3, that's to say the rest of Scene 3. Uh, and we're going to evaluate the duplicitous means, deceitful actions of characters, and find out what King Duncan's sons, Malcolm and Donald Wayne, do. To access the scene you need to know what the following words mean. Anointed means chosen by God. Um, Macbeth pretends that God's anointed one has left his temple or gone from thence, from there. Um, Gorgon is a horrifying mythological character. If they look at you, they turn you to stone. You may have heard of a character called Medusa. She had two sisters and they were Gorgons, uh, daughters of Titans, I believe. Uh, countenance means to face or to think about something Lease is the yeast he deposits in wine. Macbeth again pretends that there's no quality left in the world. It's wine has been poured away and just the yeast is left. And there's mention of daggers steeped in blood. Uh, so let's recap. Lady Macbeth on the top left has instructed Macbeth on top right to kill the king. Lady Macbeth has taken control of the situation because Macbeth was panicked. Duncan, rest in peace, the bottom left. Banquo on the bottom right is going to be the father of a generation of kings, beginning with Fleons, possibly uh, his son in the middle. Uh, the beginning of the scene, well, last scene we met the porter, didn't we? Remember there was a knocking. Some of you did some extraordinary porter speeches using the knocking as well. It's a really celebrated scene. And uh, I'm celebrating your work still, thank you. Now Lennox comes in with Macduff, they were the ones knocking. And um, Lennox says, the night has been unruly, where we lay our chimneys were blown down, as, as they say, lamenting's heard in the air. And 
He mentions later that the obscure bird clamoured in the lifelong, live-long night. Some say the earth was feverish and shook. So Shakespeare's saying the weather was awful that night. There were strange cries in the air. And Shakespeare's really using this as symbolic that of nature, symbolic of Duncan's importance, nature weeping, if you like, for uh, for the dis reflecting the, the disorder in Scotland. Then... In the rest of Act 2, Scene 3, we're going to read that together now. We're going to read it closely. Uh, after Macduff enters, he goes to see King Duncan because he wants to call him for a chat, discovers he's dead, comes back and says... Bear with me while I jump from one app to the other. Sense and sense and sense. Yeah, there's panic, awake, awake. The next scene we've just read. Yes, so Macduff re enters and says, Horror, horror. Tongue can't conceive. I cannot name the horror I just witnessed. He says confusion has made his masterpiece. Everybody has lost their sense of order. The murder has been sacrilegious. The most sacrilegious murder has broke open. The Lord's anointed temple, it's actually Macduff saying this, the Lord's anointed temple, i.e. King Duncan, who has been appointed by God, anointed by God, has left and taken life out of the building. Macbeth pretends to be innocent. What is, what is, what do you mean the life is out of the building? Um, Macduff instructs Macbeth and Lennox to go to the king's chamber, approach it and destroy your sight with a new gorgon. What do gorgons do to people if they look at them? Look at them. They turn them to stone. So Macbeth is saying that he throws when he looked at Macbeth, uh, Mac a Duncan dead. I should say later we're going to ask you to write a news report on what's happened in the scene. Um, so Macbeth and us go to investigate. Mac of course, Macbeth knows exactly what's what's happened, and. Macduff continues, ring the alarm bell, murder, treason. Remember, the audience would have been familiar with that famous plot, gunpowder plot, that occurred just a couple of years before. Um, wake up, Banquo, Donalbane and Malcolm. These are the sons. These are the two princes. Shake off your sleep. Look at great Doom's image. Malcolm, from your graves, rise up and walk like sprites to face, to countenance this horror. So all hell is breaking loose now and it's chaos. Lady Macbeth comes in, but look how cool headed she is. What's the business? What's the noise? Speak, speak, tell me what's going on. You remember Lady Macbeth instructed her husband to go and put on his nightgown and look innocent. Um gentle lady, there's nothing gentle about Lady Macbeth, is there at the moment? This is ironic. Um I can't repeat to a woman's ear because it might kill you. You know, that isn't the case at all. Uh, more chaos. Lady Macbeth, what? Has this happened in our house? Banquo's disbelieving. Prithee, I please contradict yourself. Say it isn't so. Now look at this outrageous uh, example of equivocation by Macbeth. Had I but died an hour before, I had, I would have been blessed. So it's equivocation because it's true. If Macbeth had died an hour before now, he wouldn't have committed the murder, and therefore he would have still been blessed. He had that charmed, polite life. Now he's a murderer. He isn't blessed. Remember, he takes religion seriously because he wasn't able to pray, having heard the gods, the sleepy gods, say are men in their sleep. There's nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renown and grace is dead. This is true, and it shows how Macbeth respects King Duncan as a man of renown. Uh, well respected and somebody who's graceful so Macbeth is carrying some of that guilt 
the wine of life is drawn and the mere lease is left without. The lease is left after the wine has been poured away. Do you remember what lease means? Yes, it's the, the deposits of yeast, the valueless substance after the valuable wine has been poured away. Donald Bain, Malcolm, the sons of the king arrive. What's wrong? Um, Macbeth says you are and you do not know it. This could be another example of equivocation. What do you think? The prince is saying what's wrong? Malcolm says you are. Macbeth says you are. Why could he be saying that to Donald Bain? Well, because he presents Malcolm and Donald Bain are both threats to Macbeth's title because they're next in line. Um, Macduff, your royal father's murdered. Um, actually, there's something I need to show you a bit further up. Macbeth, when he returns from the back a bit when Macbeth returned from the from seeing the king he said what's it further down yes here it is uh, Oh, forgive me, we just continue as normal. So Macduff says, your royal father's murdered. And Macbeth says that I was so angry that I killed them while they were sleeping. Macduff, and in one of the first signs that Macduff is suspicious of Macbeth, why on earth did you kill the gods? Macbeth says to us, or to Macduff, um, who can be wise, who can be self-contained, who can be composed, who can be um irrational when you've just witnessed somebody you love murdered Macbeth's excuse is that in my fury i killed them but really we know that Macbeth is trying to eliminate any witnesses but note this first example of Macduff challenging Macbeth for his actions these are going to turn into protagonist and antagonist later on Macbeth Pre pleads innocence by saying, Duncan and his silver skin laced with golden blood made me feel so loving towards him that I executed the um, the people who had, who were breached with gore, who were covered with gore. So Macbeth pretends to be judge, jury and executioner. Now let's, Macduff pretends, Lady Macbeth pretends to faint um, and be the vulnerable person we know she isn't at this stage. Malcolm and Donalbain says, now realise they're in danger from a mysterious assassin, and they decide to go to England, Malcolm, and to Ireland, Donalbain, because they are, they feel that they're in danger. Macbeth, meanwhile, plans to have a summit or a meeting outside with all the others. Let's investigate the murder. Let's meet in the hall together. So we leave the stage with a very important line, actually. There's daggers in men's smiles. We should suspect everybody. This is one of the themes of the play, really. It's the idea that you can look polite, but be evil. Macbeth, in other words, he smiles, he's politeness, and uh, he's that courtly, gentlemanly character that you want around, you want on your side, but really there are daggers in his smiles. Remember his wife asks him to look like the flower, but to be the serpent. It's the idea that, um, similar to equ equ equivocation, you look one way, but really your thoughts are murderous. Your thoughts are deceitful. So that ends the scene. And bear with me now as I jump back to the other app. Share, we need audio and we need the PowerPoint. Yes, so your tasks are one of these three. Write a script for a short news flash telling people what just happened. If you've forgotten, either go back into the video or look forward into the summary I made yesterday. 
or whatever it was, um, stretching, write a tabloid news story breaking the news or to write a broadsheet story breaking the news. It's similar to the stretching version, but you use slightly more formal language. Now to plan your article, and your article, that's the plan here. You need a catchy headline on the right hand side there, content clues, catchy headline. Here's an example from well, the British press in the 1900s. Peaceful end in sleep. This is the death of King George, uh, our Queen's father. Peaceful end in sleep. So catchy headline. First paragraph should, should stay, say what has happened. Have a look at my model. I view sacrilege in Scotland as King slain, my catchy title. Last night, our great King Duncan was discovered dead in his bedchamber. That's my first paragraph. Second paragraph should give more detail, so let's see what more detail I've given. During the unruly weather conditions last night, cries rang out from Castle Ill Inverness. Our noble king was discovered uh, bearing knife wounds. So third paragraph, a quotation from who was there. So we know Macduff was there, for instance. He says, it's sacrilege, said the Thane of Fife, Macduff. My legs turned to stone. So I borrowed some language from Shakespeare, some of that imagery to create my example of a news report. So that's your task. Um, so I'll leave you with those questions. Choose one of the three newspaper tasks and write an account of the tragic night of Inverness Castle. So there are three options, either news flash, tabloid article or broadsheet article. And a quick reminder of pathetic fantasy, what weather does Lennox report and why? Uh, right, so I made a summary of the scene. It's, it's rather surreal, frankly. And um, this is, I must stress, it is fantasy. There is no singing in Macbeth. Uh, Lady, Mac, Lady Macbeth is never on stage, nor is Macduff. But what I've tried to capture is the feeling of suspicion in Macduff that's going to be apparent, more apparent later, and it's only hinted at now. So what's this quick summary? I'll see you on the other side. Students, good evening and welcome to the Welcome to the Heath. After the comic relief of the last scene in which the porter uh, made a satirical comment about ta a tailor, uh, a, an equivocator and uh, someone else, we now go to Inverness Castle where all hell breaks loose. The person knocking at the door was actually Macduff and his entourage. Macduff is going to exchange some pleasantries with, Mac with Macbeth. He's going to discover that the king has died and he's going to advise the heirs to the throne, Malcolm <coughs> and Donald Bain to flee to different parts of the United Kingdom. And uh, they're going to refer to how nature has been upset Scotland has crumbled overnight and it's really really a disaster for for the for the thanes of Scotland the heir to the throne uh, the the king has been has been unseated and that great chain of being has been destroyed so uh and also macbeth is falls under suspicion because macduff from the very outset thinks macbeth is somehow involved um but we thought we'd treat such. We thought we'd introduce. We thought we'd introduce a little comedy to the tragedy. So where are we going? Yes, to Inverness Castle, where there are strange things going on within the wall.
the shark bait of that teeth, dear, and it shows them pearly white. Such a dark night as old Maggie's babe, and he keeps it out of sight. You know the shark bites with his teeth bait, scarlet billows dart his breath, and see glad souls of my teeth bait, so there's never, never a trace of blood on the side wall, and in morning lies our body just is in light and someone sneaking round the corner could that someone be memorable the night unruly strange events dear horror horror red turned white just a jackknife, I fear Macbeth, babe. But he keeps it out of sight. Well, that shark bit with his teeth, babe. Royal scarlet start to spread. Fancy gloves, oh, where's old Macbeth, babe? So there's never, never a trace of red. Now in the palace, a sacrilegious, oh dear, your royal father just oozing life. Don to Ireland and milk to England Could that someone be Matt the Knife <laughs> So uh, that song from the 60s seem to fit somehow because it's about somebody who commits murder but then wears fancy gloves or um, clothes that give no sense that he's been so appalling and um, just really somehow chimed with Macbeth's behaviour. So again, choose a task, a newspaper task and write about the weather and we'll see you after the weekend. Cheers. <laughs>